Courtney asks, when does it make sense to buy permanent life insurance instead of a term policy, particularly when you're young and healthy? Thank you for your question, Courtney. This show will review the different types of life insurance and tips to know which one is right for you. You need life insurance if you have dependents, like a spouse, partner, child, or aging parents who would be financially hurt if you died. I know, thinking about death is not an exciting financial topic, but life insurance is one of the best ways to protect your loved ones and leave a legacy. It allows people who depend on you to maintain their lifestyle or reach specific goals, like going to college if you weren't around. And even if you don't have dependents, you can use some or all of a life policy for charitable giving. And you can spend some life policies before you die. So no matter your family or financial situation, stay with me to learn the benefits of life insurance. Hey, friends, welcome back to the Money Girl podcast. I really appreciate you downloading the show. I'm Laura Adams, an award-winning author who's been bringing you personal finance tips every week since 2008 with over 40 million downloads. I'm also a keynote speaker, and I work with select brands doing on-camera and writing work as a spokesperson and consumer advocate. Please reach out if you want to collaborate for a speaking event or a PR campaign. As always, you can reach me using my contact page at lauradadams.com. That's also where you can learn more about my work, award-winning personal finance books, and money courses. You can also leave me a message by calling 302-364-0308. So let's talk about the different types of life insurance just to set the stage for the answer to Courtney's question. There are several types of life insurance out there, but you can really divide them into two main categories. So think about a whole category called temporary or term, and then another category for permanent policies. So term life only insures your life for a specified period. It could be 10 years, 20, 30 years. If you pay a fixed annual premium and you die within the term, so you've got a 10-year policy and you die within that 10-year term, the beneficiary or multiple beneficiaries that you name will receive a guaranteed death benefit. And, you know, you get to choose the death benefit. It could be $250,000, $500,000, a million or more. Let's say you purchase a 20-year $500,000 term policy with your spouse as the beneficiary. If you die before the policy expires in 20 years, your spouse will receive that death benefit of a $500,000 lump sum payment. But if you die in 21 years after the policy is no longer in force, your beneficiary would receive nothing. So the policy would have no residual value unless you purchase a type of policy called a return of premium or ROP. That type of policy would return a portion or all of the premiums that you paid over the policy's life. And as you can imagine, an ROP life insurance policy is more expensive than a standard term life because the insurer knows you may outlive the policy. While it would certainly be better to have coverage for your entire life, a significant benefit of term life, especially when you're young and healthy, is that it's quite inexpensive. You can get a lot of coverage for a relatively small premium. For example, let's say you're in your 30s. A 20-year, $500,000 term life policy might only cost a few hundred dollars a year. While you can typically renew a term policy before its expiration, the price does increase as you age. So once that policy expires and you're in your 50s, that same policy, the 20-year $500,000 benefit, might cost several thousand dollars a year or more depending on your health. So the older and less healthy you are, the higher your term life premium will be. Okay, now let's switch gears and talk about permanent life. So this is the other main insurance category. And permanent life covers you no matter when you die. However, 
Some policies specify a maturity date. Uh, It could be living to 100. Some could even be as old as 120. And as you can imagine, it's more expensive than term life because it's covering you for a longer period. It's covering you for your entire life. And it's also a more complex product with various subcategories that we'll talk about. So in addition to paying a death benefit to your beneficiaries, a permanent life policy is also a financial investment. Generally, a portion of each premium you pay goes into an investment account that builds what's called cash value, and that builds on a tax-deferred basis. So that investment component of a permanent policy is the complicated part of permanent life that I'm referring to, but I'm going to break it down so that it's really easy to understand. So what are the different types of permanent life insurance? Well, there are three main types of permanent life insurance called whole, universal, and variable. Now, they all come with different features and benefits, but I just want you to remember that each one covers you your entire life. So let me break it down into what you need to know about each type. Let's start with whole life insurance. With this product, you pay a fixed annual premium. So that's, it's set, it never changes. You get a guaranteed death benefit and you get a guaranteed rate of return on your cash value. So this is the most straightforward type of permanent life, but it's also the most expensive because it comes with no risk to the buyer. You're getting a lot of guarantees with this product. And as I mentioned, a portion of a whole life premium pays for insurance and a portion goes into conservative fixed income investments. And that's how the insurer will generate that guaranteed premium for you. You're not going to choose those investments or even necessarily know what they are. That's on the insurer to provide you that guaranteed return. But after a set period, you do have some flexibility with the cash value, like you might be able to borrow against it or even cancel the policy and cash it out for an amount known as the surrender value. However, the longer you own a whole life policy, the higher your total return on that policy will be. All right, so that's whole life. It's a pretty straightforward, um, you know, low risk, but fairly expensive type of permanent life insurance. Let's talk about another type. The next one is universal life insurance. With this, a portion of your premium pays for the insurance and a portion goes into a cash value account. However, unlike whole life The premiums are flexible. You can actually adjust the premium and even the death benefit within specific guidelines to meet your needs. For instance, you could pay less or even no premium in a given year if there's enough cash value to cover your premium. The return on your cash value gets tied to a financial index or is even set by the insurance company, typically with a guaranteed minimum interest rate. And the third type of permanent is called variable life. With this, a portion of your premium does pay for insurance and a portion goes into investment options, such as mutual funds. So it's similar to universal life, except you as the policyholder choose how to invest your money from a menu of options. If those investments in your variable policy perform well, your cash value could rise far above what you could earn from a whole or a universal policy. But if they underperform, you could lose part of your cash value. So variable life gives you the most flexibility, but it also comes with the most risk of all the permanent policies. I want to note that these three are not the only types of permanent life insurance because each of these categories has product subcategories with various features. So my goal here is just to give you an overview of the main types of permanent life options and explain how they compare to term life. 
All right, now that we've done a little overview, I want to talk about some of the factors in getting approved for life insurance. When you apply for a term or a permanent policy, insurers use many factors to evaluate you and quote you a rate. The underwriting process varies by company, but basically they're trying to estimate how likely you are to die and when. Some companies require a physical exam with a doctor or nurse, but some offer a no exam rate, but it actually could cost you more. It could be a higher quote than getting an exam if you're in good condition, if your health is is good right now. So the older and the less healthy you are, the more expensive coverage will be because you're more likely to die sooner rather than later. That's why it's better to get life insurance as soon as you need it, because younger applicants pay less. And you never know when your health could decline and it could be, you know, a severe condition that makes you ineligible for life insurance or it could make a policy unaffordable for you. Life insurers depend on mortality statistics, and they know that women tend to live longer than men, which means women typically pay less for life insurance. Insurers also know that you can have inherited health risks, so they usually ask you about immediate family members' health or the cause of their death. Your lifestyle also significantly influences what you're going to pay for life insurance. For instance, smoking, excessive drinking, using illegal drugs or having a history of drug use, or being overweight, all of those will increase your rates. What you do for work is important, like being in a high-risk occupation, like mining or flying planes. That can lead to higher premiums or even getting denied coverage. And the same for your hobbies, like are you a skydiver or, you know, do you climb mountains, that sort of thing. There are other factors in life insurance rates that you might not expect, such as your driving record. You're going to pay more if you have a history of DUI or being in car accidents. It just shows that you may be, you know, a riskier policyholder. Traveling to high-risk countries, either for pleasure or work, can also affect your insurability and rate. Plus, many insurers consider your credit history in your overall risk profile. Since every life insurance company considers these and even more factors differently, they, you know, they weight these factors differently based on their underwriting requirements, it's always best to shop around. You can check out a site like Policy Genius for hassle-free online quotes from the nation's largest insurance companies. There is no downside to getting multiple life quotes. Saving money is the upside. Yeah, it probably takes a little bit more time to get multiple quotes, but that is really important for making sure you're getting the best policy for the lowest price. And speaking of saving money, I mentioned that with permanent life, your cash value builds on a tax-deferred basis, which is a fantastic benefit. So you don't owe any taxes on gains while they're inside that life insurance policy. But if you withdraw cash from a permanent policy, the amount from your premiums is typically tax-free because that money was paid into the policy on an after-tax basis. However, when you dip into excess cash value in a policy, that amount would be considered taxable income because that's a portion that has not yet been taxed. Another interesting feature of some permanent life policies is borrowing or taking a tax-free loan against your cash value. However, it could become taxable if you don't pay the policy premium or you surrender a policy for cash and have an outstanding loan. Similarly, surrendering a policy for more than the premiums you paid would trigger income taxes on the excess amount. However, the payout your beneficiaries receive from a term or permanent policy is typically not considered taxable income. So your heirs don't have to report their life insurance proceeds on their income taxes. Okay, now let's return to Courtney's question about when to buy permanent life instead of a term policy, especially if you're young and healthy. Since the annual premium for a permanent policy can cost like 10 times more than term, you definitely need a good reason to buy it. 
So I'm going to give you five situations when buying permanent life could make sense. Number one, you have lifetime dependents, like a disabled family member with special needs who can't earn an income or will require ongoing care and financial support after your death. Number two, you want to leave a financial legacy to heirs, maybe a charity or institutions, no matter when you die. Number three, you have a large estate and you want life insurance proceeds to pay the estate taxes after your death. Number four, you want final expenses covered, such as your funeral costs and maybe debts, no matter when you die. And five, you have a high income and you've already maxed out your retirement account options, but you've got more money to invest and you want to do that on a tax deferred basis to build a policy's cash value. So Courtney, if none of those situations apply to you, you probably don't need permanent life. You'd probably be better off with an inexpensive term policy to protect your loved ones. However, If you're unsure, some term policies can be converted to permanent life. That would allow you to maintain coverage even if you're not healthy enough to qualify for a new policy at the end of a term. So you want to look for that option, you know, if you're concerned about not being able to renew a term policy. I also want to mention that even if you get term life insurance at work, it may not be enough. You can also buy an additional term or permanent policy on your own. You can have as many life insurance policies as you want. Remember that if you leave your job, your life insurance typically ends on the last day of the month unless you negotiate to extend it with your employer. Now, a general rule of thumb that you may have heard is to buy life insurance with a benefit of at least 10 times your annual income. That is a very rough guideline. So I just mention it here as, you know, something to to consider. If you've got children or other family dependents, always err on the side of buying too much coverage rather than too little. Also, don't forget that the death of a stay-at-home parent would significantly affect the finances of most households. So a stay-at-home parent needs life insurance too. Maybe they don't need as much as a breadwinning parent, but that is just something to consider. How would you manage the care for your children if a stay-at-home parent were no longer around? Courtney, thank you again for your question. I definitely recommend consulting with a certified financial planner or a life insurance specialist to get more information about the costs and benefits of various life policies and to really hone in on exactly how much coverage you need. That's all for now. I'll talk to you next week. Until then, here's to living a richer life. Money Girl is a quick and dirty tips podcast. It's audio engineered by Steve Rickyberg with editing by Adam Cecil. Our advertising operations specialist is Morgan Christensen. Our digital operations specialist is Holly Hutchins. And our marketing and publicity associate is Davina Tomlin. Mm-hmm.